In this video, we're going to find the area of the surface generated by rotating the, the curve y equals e to the x from x equals 0 to x equals 1 about the x-axis. So if we were to try to look at this picture real quickly, uh, what it looks like is, is the following. We have our exponential curve y equals e to the x. Um, it looks something like this y equals e to the x. We want to go from x equals 0 to x equals 1, like so. Uh, so we have 0, 1 as a point, and 1, e as a second point. And we want to take this curve and rotate it around the x-axis, like so. So drawing a typical radius will look something like this. Notice we're just looking for the y-coordinate of the function. If we're trying to find the area of the surface of revolution, we're going to use our formula s equals the integral of 2 pi r ds. Now, let's, let's be careful as we're going through this, right? We have to decide, do we want to integrate with respect to x or y? Um, we know the bounds if we're going to integrate with respect or y. x is going to sit between 0 and 1, like we were told. y, we can see, will range from 1 to e which is perfectly acceptable. Um, the radius is equal to y, so that's kind of nice, but we can also describe y in terms of x. So I'm not really leaning one way or the other. Uh, do be aware though, if we, take, if we take a dx approach, if we take a dx approach, uh, then our ds will look like the square root of one plus y prime squared uh, dx which would look more like, because in this situation, y is e to the x, we would get 1 plus e to the 2x dx. Uh, so that's something to deal with. Um, but notice with if the radius is an e to the x, you'd have an e to the x with this together. And I think that actually looks really good for us. Let's take a look at that. Um, if you integrate this with respect to x, you'll go from 0 to 1, 2 pi e to the x, take the square root of 1 plus e to the 2x dx. Or, if you prefer, it might be better to look at this as e to the x squared dx. Uh, we'll see in a second why that actually might be a good a choice. Um, this is an integral that we could do. We could do this one because uh, I think we could first start off with a u substitution, u to be e to the x. That way, du equals e to the x dx like so, um, and then as you switch from x to u, you'll go from 0 to 1, uh, which you would get, let's see, when x is 0, y, or u would equal 1. When x is 1, you're going to get u is equal to e. And so you get the following integral if you do this u substitution. You'd end up with 1 to e, 2 pi, uh, um, and the e, the x, d, the e, x, dx would come together just to be a du, and you're going to get the square root of 1 plus u squared du. Now, I want to mention to you that this integral we just set up using u, this was the integral we would get if we had set it up with respect to y. So the thing is, in this situation, if you try to set this thing up with respect to x or y, you're going to gravitate towards this integral anyways. Like I said, this is the integral you get when you set it up with respect to y. Um, but it, it, that this is okay because we can we can actually calculate this thing uh, just fine. Um, if we were to calculate this, well, we're gonna have to do another substitution. This time, a trigonometric substitution. Take u to equal tangent theta, then du equals secant squared theta d theta, and then the square root of one plus u squared will equal secant theta. As we switch the bounds one more time, as you go from u to theta, when u equals 1, you want tangent. When, when is tangent equal to 1? That happens at pi fourths. And then the last one, when, e equal, or when u equals e, you're going to get arctangent of e, which I'm just going to call that alpha for short as we go forward here. Uh, so making that substitution you're gonna get two pi integrate from pi force to alpha. You're gonna get the square root of one plus u squared, which is a secant theta. Du is gonna become a secant squared theta d theta, uh, which we've seen this, we've seen this puppy before. 
Uh, secant cubed is not a super easy one to do, but we have done it before. So we're just gonna make that uh, statement right here. You're gonna get two pi times one half times tangent theta secant theta and then add to that the natural log of the absolute value of secant theta plus tangent theta. And we're gonna go from alpha to pi force. Uh, so plug in these things in here. Do notice that two pi times one half, of course, is just equal to pi. Plugging in alpha, we're gonna get tangent of, of alpha. Remember alpha, is the square or alpha like we saw before is arc tangent of e so tangent of alpha is going to equal e we're going to get secant of alpha we're going to have to come back for that one plus the natural log of the absolute value of secant of alpha plus e that's the first bit then we're going to subtract tangent of pi halves sorry, sorry pi fourths we already know that one is going to equal one so I'm just gonna replace that with a one times secant of pi four. So we'll have to come back to that one in just a second. Uh, and then we're also subtracting the natural log of secant of pi four plus one. Now uh, secant of pi four isn't so bad uh, because after all secant of pi four is just gonna equal one over cosine of pi four. Cosine of pi force, a lot of us remember as root two over two, but this is the same thing as one over the square root of two, which means secant of pi force is the square root of two. Uh, so we can use that in these calculations above. Uh, secant of alpha takes a little bit more effort, but not beyond our reach. If we think of the associated right triangle here, where the angle is associated to alpha, since, since we know that tangent of alpha equals e over one, we get e and one. Then the other side will be the square root of one plus e squared. Secant is gonna be the hypotenuse over the adjacent side. So we see that secant of alpha is the square root of one plus e squared. Square root of one plus e squared, like so. And so putting this all together, we end up with pi times e times the square root of one plus e squared plus the natural log of e plus the square root of one plus e squared. I would love to say there's some nice simplification there, but not one that seems obvious. You get minus the square root of two and then minus the natural log of one plus the square root of two, like so. Um, in which case we then see that we, we get this, this solution, which is massively complicated. Um, this becomes the square root of 2, 22.9430. And so we get this estimate right here, accurate to four decimal places. Now, one thing I wanna mention is that if you've been paying attention to our examples with surface area, um, with surface area, even though many of them are able to be calculated, like we did this one, much easier than arc length, we still are usually ending up with these like massively complicated irrational numbers, which we have no appreciation of how big they are until we uh, estimate them anyways. So since we're sort of ending the calculation with an approximation anyways, it sort of begs the question, could we save some time and just estimate this using say Simpson's rule um, from the very get go? And in practice, that is again, how one would often do these type of things. Arc length and surface area, um, you're probably not gonna have much benefit of doing this exactly because you want an approximation anyway. So, you know, so what I'm saying is in, in practice, a uh, numerical approximation is typically sufficient for these type of situations. Now, of course, with the homework question, it might want you to practice these integration techniques so an exact answer might be required. But be aware that, again, in, in practice, numerical approximations become very much king in situations like we're in right now.